Good afternoon. On behalf of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, I'd like to welcome you to our web event entitled Patient and Family-Centered Care Approaches for Children and Seniors. I'm Judy Consalvo with ARC's Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement, and we're very excited about today's topic and glad to see that you share our enthusiasm. We have over 600 registered for this event today. Next slide. Before we begin, I would like to introduce you to our webcast console. You can resize your console to fit your entire browser window. All the components on the console can be resized, moved, and minimized into the menu dock at the bottom of the console. If the slides are too small, click on the lower right-hand corner of the slide window and drag your mouse down to make it larger. Twitter functionality is available in the console for today's webcast. Please feel free to participate using the hashtag AHRQIX. I would also like to remind you that if you experience any technical problems, you may click on the question mark button at the bottom of the screen to access the help guide, or click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to contact us directly with your question. Medical staff will work with you to resolve any issues. After each presentation, we will hold a 10-minute Q&A discussion based on questions that you submit. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation. Simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question into the Q&A box and select Submit. We welcome your questions and comments on the upcoming presentation and look forward to an engaging dialogue that will promote the spread of healthcare innovations. You can access today's slides by clicking on the widget at the bottom of your screen that says Download Slides. This will generate a PDF version of the presentation that you can download and save. Also, we are pleased to offer closed captioning on this web seminar. To access the closed captioning, please click on the link called Closed Captioning that is on the lower right-hand view. After you click the link, a new window will open and the text of the discussion. Next slide, please. So what is the Healthcare Innovations Exchange? The presenters that you will hear from today are innovators from ARC's Healthcare Innovations Exchange. For those of you who are new to the Innovations Exchange, I'll take just a minute to give you an overview. ARC created the exchange to speed the implementation of new and better ways of delivering health care. The exchange offers busy health and researchers a variety of opportunities to ultimately adopt evidence-based innovations and tools suitable for a range of healthcare settings and populations. The Innovations Exchange website includes a searchable database of quality tools, as well as profiles outlining innovations in service delivery and in policy. The exchange also contains both successes and attempts, innovator stories and lessons learned, and expert commentaries. To assist you in implementing these innovations, ARC also supports learning and networking opportunities such as web seminars, tweet chats, and podcasts. We post new content to the website every two weeks on a range of topics and hope that you will sign up to stay connected with us if you have not already done so. Next slide. So the Innovations Exchange web event series, uh, this is a second in our patient and family-centered care ser series. The first entitled Patient and Family-Centered Care for Adults with Chronic Conditions was held on May 20th and described the efforts at Georgia Regions Medical Center. Georgia Regions implemented a program of patient advisors that participate in hospital councils, committees, staff training, and other activities. These advisors contribute to improve patient satisfaction and better organizational performance. You can watch the two-minute video highlighting the Georgia Regions innovation by visiting our website, www.innovations.arc.gov, and clicking on the tab labeled Videos. 
the web event is also available for viewing on our website. The website also holds an archive of our past web events, podcasts, and uh, tweet chats, and we invite you to take a look at you in your practice. A copy of today's web event will be available on our website within two weeks. So let's turn to our agenda for today. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Bev Johnson, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care. Ms. Johnson has provided technical assistance and consultation for advancing the practice of patient and family-centered care to over 250 hospitals, health systems, federal, state, and provincial agencies, military treatment facilities, and community organizations. She assists programs seeking to change organizational culture, and she facilitates the integration of patient and family-centered care concepts into policies, facility design, and educational program for healthcare professionals. Des? Thank you, Judy, and it's wonderful to have this opportunity to have a, a conversation with so many people across the country about uh, innovations related to patient and family-centered care, and, and today to explore it in more depth through of children and youth um, and um, with seniors, particularly in emergency uh, departments. As um, foundational to our discussion today, I just would like to review the core concepts of patient and family-centered care so we have a shared understanding um, of this approach. Uh, basically, patient and family-centered care is an approach to the planning, implementation, and evaluation of health care in mutually beneficial partnerships among patients, families, and health care professionals across all disciplines. And this approach really uh, respects relationships and that those relationships are are really the strength of those relationships is around respect and dignity, and that's respect and dignity for everyone, whether it's a young child, their family, a frail elderly person, their family, and all those who work in hospitals or clinics. We just we have to work together and work together with a sense of respect and dignity for all. The second core concept is how we share information with people, that we share information with them in ways that are useful and affirming. And with a patient and family-centered practice, we know we get the best outcomes when we encourage and support the active participation of patients and families in their own care, and we connect with them um, at the level they prefer and encourage them and support um, meaningful participation. And lastly, it's collaboration uh, with patients and families in making improvement to really um, ensure that we have patient and family-centered care implemented in all of our facilities across all settings. We need to partner with patients and families in program development and healthcare re redesign, education and professionals, and even in research. Um, a simple definition, and I think you will hear it so much reflected in the two, uh, three wonderful speakers we have about the, the two programs you're going to hear about. Patient and family center care is working with patients and families rather than doing things just to and for them. The, I think also, uh, regardless of the setting where you work, um, you realize that uh, to care effectively for patients, particularly for patients who may be vulnerable because of a chronic condition, they're very young, they're very old, that these people are often very dependent on either family or other um, care partners in the community. And so we need to think about through our care practices how we can involve and support and bring in the family broadly defined, um, to really be allies for quality and safety and assuring that we're getting the best outcomes. Um, we're fortunate today, and we're going to be hearing in depth about a particular program at Hasbro Children's Hospital, um, 
but the hospital more broadly um, is very committed to patient and family-centered practice and to partnering with families in a number of ways. So they have a family advisory council that provides a structure so there can be a dialogue with clinicians and staff and leaders about the needs and priorities and preferences of, of families, what their perception of the care experience is and how it can be improved, that this council provides a structure so that these partnerships can really be meaningful and effective. And they are having direct impact on policies, programs, and facilities. Um, I think you might find it interesting uh, where some of the Hasley advisors are working. Um, and a best practice is really to not just have a council, but to bring patient and family advisors working side by side with you on key working committees and task forces. So at, at Hasbro, they are working, there is a, a oversight steering committee, which I think is very important when you're really trying to transform the culture of an organization, to have this leadership kind of uh, committee that can encourage, support the work, and even help remove barriers. But the family advisors are one of the initiatives they're working on is trying to promote the hospital as a, a healthy environment. Uh, they're working to reduce harm, so very ambitious zero harm committee includes family advisors, also on the safety and quality committee, and they're looking also into improving support to support family presence, and so the family rooms uh, throughout the facility. Uh, the uh, additional current priorities are the um, as part of the, the palliative care service, focusing on alternative medicine programming. And I think this is really important in our work in lots of hospitals around the country and community programs. Often pu the public doesn't even understand the term palliative care. And by having family advisors part of this, they can help translate and help those of us who work inside healthcare organizations translate these concepts in ways that are useful and meaningful to the public. They're also working side by side with security. Uh, again, this is another wonderful way that you can partner with families to help preserve that the facility is welcoming and inviting, but also safe for everyone, patients, families, and staff. They're also partnering with the nutrition department to improve healthy options, and I bet this is involving uh, children as advisors as well, and there are opportunities they have for improving signage in the outdoor play area. So a whole range of interesting projects their advisors are working on. I think this last uh, innovation is particularly important in that it um, – it is a major lever in particularly academic medical centers if we can change how teaching clinical rounds are conducted, that they are conducted across disciplines and with patients and families. And they've, patient and fam the family advisors have been very involved at Hasbro to shadow physicians and the team conducting the daily rounds and providing feedback, and they have now developed a video that they will be used for teaching because this is a new way for faculty and trainees to work. So we need to support this change in practice. But they're also going to be um, using this to educate patients and families and using the Get Well Network uh, so that they can learn right at the bedside. I, I'm really very excited. I think this is a, a lever for dramatic change in um, uh, the patient experience in in hospitals. I now would like to uh, introduce to you um, two wonderful people that are going to talk about a very innovative program at uh, Hasbro Children's Hospital, the family-based integrated day treatment for children and adolescents with complex pediatric illness. And as they will describe, this is not only uh, physical illness, but um, mental health and behavioral health issues are are um, addressed in this clinic together. And speaking with us today, we have Michelle Rickerby, um, 
who is the psychiatric co-director of the Hasbro uh, Children's Program and is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at um, the Brown University Medical School. Uh, she has um, a lot of expertise in really family-based treatment of complex pediatric illness. Um, and um, she is also the co-director of a family therapy program for child psychiatry residencies and the triple board residency at Brown. Um, joining Michelle today is Diane Dermardorosian, um, is, and she's the pediatric co-director of this program. And she worked previously um, as the medical director of a Hasbro eating disorder clinic. Um, Diane also serves on the Patient and Family Centered Steering Committee um, uh, at the hospital, and she is on the uh, Pediatric Faculty Development uh, Steering Committee as as well. So before you get a chance to talk directly with uh, Michelle and Diane, um, they are going to share their thoughts on a video, and then they will join the conversation today. Jen was a 15-year-old young woman who was diagnosed with diabetes when she was a toddler. She was struggling with episodic symptoms, including getting short of breath, sometimes feeling very panicky, going through periods of feeling suicidal. And in addition, of course, her father was deployed in the Middle East, leading to the family feeling anxious and panicked anyway. It was keeping her from going to school, and actually she ended up having several emergency room visits. The doctors who referred her to us felt like we could help sort out what was really going on for Jen and support the family in, in helping her getting back to her life. Jen came to our program, which is a multidisciplinary med psych day treatment program, which runs five days a week and modulates the school day. What we're doing is treating kids in context and most importantly, really acknowledging that when we treat kids, we really are treating their families. The level of her blood sugar was quite high. That can really contribute to kids not feeling well, to being fatigued. We were able to provide uh, extensive education for Jen and her family around diabetes. Jen, you know, was a teenager who had struggled with a lot of social anxiety. When teenagers and younger kids are in our program, it may represent the first time ever in their lives they've been able to openly talk about their illnesses with peers. What we really know to be the case is that if we don't really incorporate the whole family into the treatment, that we're really not going to support kids in an optimal way. Although her father was stationed in the Middle East at the time, we were able to arrange having him involved in a family meeting by Skype. Where everybody was really able to give Jen the message that they wanted to see her Thrive. They wanted to see her get back to school. So after four weeks, control of her diabetes was much improved, and Jen was able to transition back to school and able to function uh, like any other teenager in school and with her extracurricular activities. The adult medicine and psychiatry world has a lot to take from our experience as well. If providers of all types, medical providers from different disciplines, psychological providers, everyone who's involved in taking care of the whole family don't talk to one another, patients aren't going to receive uh, optimal care. My name is Diane Dermardorosian. And my name is Michelle Rickerby. We believe that joining with families to treat the whole child leads to healthier kids. Thank you, Bev, for that kind introduction and for all of the amazing work you do in this area. Um, we're really honored to be part of this important program. Um, we're able to do the work we do because we do it as a team. And the team um, includes our incredible patients and families with whom we have the privilege to partner, our amazing Hasbro multidisciplinary team, our program founders, Tom Ressler and Pam High. And as you mentioned, uh, Fran Pignatori, who's our patient and family-centered care manager at Hasbro, who played an invaluable role in establishing and growing our program, and now through her passion and expertise has established and fostered a patient and family-centered culture throughout Hasbro Children's Hospital and beyond. Hasbro 
Children's Partial Hospital Program is a joint program of the Department of Pediatrics and the Division of Child Psychiatry, and we treat children with both medical and emotional illnesses that co-present. It's an integrated program both from a system standpoint and also in practice. And our program's foundation is a mutually beneficial partnership that's established between providers and families. It's this partnership and shared decision making that are critical to our mission um, of supporting empowerment towards the ultimate goal of patients and families not only getting their lives back, but also thriving. Some of the ways we work to do this with families are joining with them where they're at, recognizing parents as the experts on their own children and patients as the experts on their own experiences, coordinating care and services as a multidisciplinary team that includes parents, and utilizing day treatment to maximize sustainable home-based success even beyond the time patients are in the program. The most valuable feedback we receive comes from patients and their families. In her own words, this parent highlights what she felt was most helpful in supporting positive movement for her family and her daughter, and that's the collaboration between staff and family. By respectfully partnering with patients and families, we're able to better understand the illness and the illness beliefs that exist, as well as support family strengths and relationships. And this partnership and this approach are really what help us promote health and well-being that's sustainable for patients and families. So this all sounds pretty good, but it's important to talk about how we operationalize this day. Um, the structure of our program is that we're an eight-hour-a-day, five-day-a-week day treatment program, which is a very intentional structure to be able to optimally partner with families um, when kids are with us during the day, um, often having family meetings as well, and at home in their home environment in the evenings and on the weekends. We have two milieus. One is a younger child milieu, ages 6 to 12, and the older kids are 13 to 18. Our median length of stay is 18 to 20 days. And our, um, approximately, we have 190 admissions per year. Um, it, however, in early 2015, our program is slated to expand, and we will be increasing our census by about 50% in order to meet the demand that exists um, throughout our region. It's important to think about who it is it that comes to our program, um, because it is important that patients that come have both a medical illness or presentation, as well as a psychiatric condition that's playing a role um, and that's interfering with uh, a patient's functioning. These patients must be stable enough to be at home. They can't require a 24-hour inpatient care setting from either a medical or psychiatric perspective. They may be patients who are being discharged from the inpatient setting and at high risk for readmission. Patients who are being treated in the outpatient setting with functional impairments that have been refractory to outpatient treatment. Or patients who are being treated outpatient and are at high risk for inpatient admission due to either psychiatric or medical compromise or both and in need of higher, um, in need of more intensive treatment to prevent readmission. Our program is unique in that we partner with patients and families with a variety of presentations and diagnoses, and we do it all within the same model. Our overarching approach is universal regardless of the illness presentation or the challenges. We're commonly caring for patients that have diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease or other chronic illnesses, patients with eating disorders and somatoform disorders. Some of the common challenges that we see are disordered eating, medical non-adherence, functional syndromes, school challenges and avoidance, coping issues, or medical child abuse. We have a rich multidisciplinary team focused around supporting kids and their families with nutrition, psychological, social, and educational challenges, 
And as I mentioned, the patient and the family really are at the center of this team. It's also really important to talk about the outpatient providers, who are the folks that the patient and family have chosen to partner with them on their journey longitudinally. And they are really, really valuable resources in providing history and perspective, as well as identifying treatment goals with the family and establishing follow-up care. It's essential that patients and families understand that we value the input of their identified providers and that we really are going to work together with them. And in doing so, we strengthen our partnership and support more positive shifts throughout the course of the patient's admission and beyond. Thanks, Diane. I'm going to go on and uh, share a little bit more detail about our perspective for supporting family-based integrated care and focus on what families experience during their stay with us. Um, this is a, a simple pictorial of what's a complicated process of our efforts at um, supporting families. And one important thing to note is that families and patients are always at the center of our efforts. Um, part of what hopefully comes across in this diagram, too, is we're creating a, a ring of safety around them uh, during a very vulnerable time in their lives. Our efforts aim at, of course, supporting a productive, uh, supportive relationship between our treatment team and the families, as well as supporting productive connections between family members and with families and their larger treatment network, including outpatient providers and schools. So as Diane noted, we meet families where they are. Um, and one of the ways we do this is in helping them understand the illness that they're dealing with in their child. Um, and it's not just understanding the illness entity itself, but placing that illness in the context of their child and family's life very specifically. Um, often when patients and families are entering our program, they're feeling quite hopeless and helpless in terms of uh, being able to manage the illnesses. In looking at the illness broadly, um, we assess the impact of it on family relationships and also, of course, look at the family more broadly, looking at pre-existing challenges that may have been there um, that also present a barrier to effective care. Um, uh, one way of looking at this is identifying an opportunity amidst a crisis um, to look at the bigger picture and support healthy family functioning. We make every decision in our, in our program, um, both small and large decisions, from a family-based perspective. Um, and this does not simply mean involving the family, but very actively engaging the immediate family and often extended family in the process. Um, of course, family therapy is a central piece of treatment that um, families are involved with during their stay, um, but family-based treatment goes beyond that. Um, we understand that the family and the patients are the experts in their own experience um, and make every perspective or every decision from the perspective that the family's understanding of the illness as well as family relationships are a powerful force in illness management and recovery. When we speak about um, integrated care, we're not simply talking about the concept of integrating physical and psychological issues, although of course that's something we do. Um, we really look at putting all the puzzle pieces together, which may be a quite complicated process. It's very common that uh, parents will say, after their children are with us for some period of time, I'm so thankful that you're looking at my whole child. Um, part of how we do this is by integrating uh, the messages we're giving patients and families about empowerment across all the pieces of care that they're getting, from pediatric care to psychotherapy, to case management, uh, to psychopharm interventions. Um, some of the experience that families have during their stay involve uh, daily nursing support and education. One of the very important pieces of the day is our check-in and check-out process at the end of the day when uh, families hand over the care of their children to us through our pediatric nurses. Um, both the beginning and the end of the day communication really allows us to reinforce treatment messages um, and reinforce the fact that they have a safety net with us um, while we're working with them. Um, pediatric monitoring and treatment is a very integral part of the program. 
um, which occurs throughout the course of the whole day. Another example of uh, family experience might involve nursing or nutrition education about their child's illness. We have family support groups focused on both allowing parents to share their experiences in a complicated process of supporting their children and also on educating parents around some of the skills that we're teaching their kids um, to address their illnesses. I often uh, start the family support group each week by saying to the families that one of the reasons we have the support group is to acknowledge the reality that family relationships are the most important force in both illness recovery and long-term illness management. Other experiences um, that families have, um, as I mentioned, include parent training with some of our specific skill building curriculum um, with the children. One of the important pieces that we work on with the kids is that oftentimes they're so overwhelmed that in isolation they can't employ skill building techniques. Um, so we work with the kids on knowing when they need to ask for help versus when they can manage independently. Uh, family therapy is uh, very important and central to our program. Close co collaboration not only with the other providers treating the identified patient, uh, but also collaboration with family health care providers, including parents and siblings, is, is an important part of what we do as well to have the broader picture. Um, we spend a lot of time supporting family members, most notably parents, but often siblings as well, um, in caring for themselves and actively support parents uh, seeking referrals as needed for themselves. So uh, the good news of working in some very high intensity challenges with complicated pediatric illness are that we know that a trusting partnership with patients and families is absolutely an outcomes. Um, we acknowledge that if we know where we are starting with a family in terms of their beliefs about the illness and how they're connected around it, no matter where they are to begin with, we know what to do to support them moving forward. We understand that consistent messages across providers definitely matter and are very powerful in helping families feel empowered. That excellent provider collaboration is a very strong force in supporting patient and family success, and also that any painful challenge or symptom or illness is improved set of beliefs and empathic relationships surrounding it. So I'll end on a note from a patient um, that really highlights the fact that often amidst what may be an overwhelming crisis, there really lies tremendous opportunity for people to move towards health and well-being. The partial hospital program was the best thing that ever happened to me. It changed my life. Well, Diane and Michelle, very compelling description of your wonderful program. Um, I'm sure that the listeners today will have some questions for you, and it, let's take a few moments to explore what some of those are. We we do have a question that um, is um, talking about working with uh, foster children and uh, dealing with some of the instability that's often in their lives. Um, you know. Have you, have you worked with these children, and um, how have you supported them when uh, they may placements may change frequently? Absolutely, I think that's a, an excellent question because we know this is a very vulnerable, at-risk population to begin with, and our program has experience actually in working with children in various phases of the foster care system. Um, examples might include actually children um, where we may be working both with their family um, as well as with the parents they're placed with in foster care, um, including over the trajectory of reunification. Um, we also may uh, foster families directly even when the, um, the biological families are not involved, and our model applies just the same. 
Um, one very special example of working with kids in child protective custody includes um, patients who are in group homes. Um, and although that's not a common experience that we have in our program, we have accommodated that um, over the years and partner with the group homes the way that we would with families um, and work with staff to, to support the kids' needs. That's terrific. Thank you. Uh, there's several questions um, about traumatic head injury, and probably you have worked with uh, children and families uh, with that condition, and uh, one of the questions, part of it is helping families understand the complexity of recovery, um, and um, I think there's lots of misunderstanding about um, the the progress. And then, have you um, found um, community, local support? Um, any examples of exception, exceptional care um, from education? Um, yeah, let me try to answer that question, Diane can add as well. Um, we do have definitely a fair amount of experience working with kids with a range of traumatic head injuries, and it is a very complex process, and a good example of one where often the messages families have received about the trajectory of recovery can be very confusing, partly because it can be so unpredictable. It's also a really good example that sometimes there's been overattention to some of the physical and neurocognitive aspects of recovery, um, but that there's a neglect of looking at how um, emotionally upsetting it is to the kids and demoralizing, and also the pattern of fear that can develop about moving forward with their lives. So we are able in our environment to support all aspects of that care, and, and we work very closely with um, outpatient providers, neurologists, et cetera, and school systems um, on providing a realistic um, set of goals for when kids leave. There are situations where parents and families sometimes are underestimating the deficits kids have, and other times where they may be overestimating the, the symptoms that the kids have in there for, by supporting the kids avoiding moving forward. And in our environment, because we spend um, the days with the children, we really can uh, clarify um, what's a realistic goal. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, Cincinnati about um, the children and families you're serving are truly experiencing patient and family-centered practice. Um, what are you doing to prepare the the youth and families to transition to an adult health care system. I must say, uh, I have to comment that we have work to do, and we know we do, and, and, uh, but we need to build, make sure that the adult health care system is, is patient and family-centered as pediatrics, particularly as you all have described it today. Um, really, really good questions. I think um, in terms of addressing the question of whether or not we're, you know, we are providing patient and family-centered care, um, you know, we 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 believe we are, um, and everything that we um, we do um, is is reflecting that. Um, in terms of transitioning patients to the adult care setting, we know that in so many systems that that is a challenge. Um, we we here at Hasbro have a program called uh, the Adolescent Leadership Council which is a unique program where um, patients with chronic illness um, participate and have mentors who are also have chronic illness themselves, um, but who are in college and who have actually already transitioned to the adult um, health care services in our, in our state. Um, and there are also medical students and residents um, and other folks who are part of that program. And there have been a lot of initiatives for us to work with the individual um, offices, um, you, the endocrinologists, the cardiologists, um, the pulmonologists, all the groups that are, are receiving a lot of um, patients with chronic illness that are transitioning from pediatric to adult care to support uh, a smoother transition. The other piece I would add is it's yet another example of where among 18, 19, 20-year-olds there's a huge variability in realistically what they may be able to take on in terms of their illness management. And again, sometimes the, the kids and the families may be either overestimating or underestimating that. Our environment is really good for hashing that out in the older teenagers 
and again, trying to set realistic goals and expectations and assisting outpatient providers with that as well. well I think you've described a, a wonderful way that you're beginning to to focus on that critical issue of transition, you know, individualizing it for the individual patient and family, but also trying to build the system. And the fact that you have an adolescent leadership council influencing trying to build the adult system so it is as good as what you all have done in pediatrics. Um, but I, I love the fact that in an academic medical center, you're exposing trainees and faculty to thinking about these important issues of transition. So thank you to the work you all are doing, and thank you to Paul for your thoughtful question. Uh, there's a question also um, about whether the team of physicians actually meets with the family or do you serve as the intermediary? What what does that kind of look like in your program? Yeah, there's actually multiple pieces. As you can tell from our presentation, um, there's a whole range of meetings families have while they're here. Um, we have primary therapists who are the core bridge to the families who are doing family therapy and in a lot of the meetings. But in addition to that, we have uh, a lot of meetings involving other members of our team. So for example, the psychologist, psychiatrist, pediatrician, and maybe one of the nurses may join a meeting um, at a particularly difficult juncture for a patient to clarify the medical plan. And in addition to that, it's very common here that we might put together a multi-provider meeting that includes maybe up to 20 people um, to support a child. That might include members of the extended family, multiple outpatient providers, including primary care docs, subspecialists, folks from school, mental health providers. Um, that's often something we do around the time uh, kids are transitioning out of our program. Um, Michelle, and, and thank you for that. Um, Michelle and Diane, uh, you know, throughout your presentation, you talked about the importance of team. And I, I really think it's, it's certainly exemplary in terms of reflecting patient and family-centered concepts uh, that patients and families are on the team, all the different disciplines are on the team, and people in the community. It, it feels like you're all working together. What what advice would you have for others starting a program either like this or a similar program to get that understanding of team um, where all of those players, often we describe team as an interdisciplinary team, but it, it misses the involvement of patients and families or people from the community? Yeah, I think there's a couple of key pieces of advice. One thing that we didn't highlight in the talk was our process of multidisciplinary team rounds, which we have four days a week with our entire multidisciplinary team uh, during which we talk about every patient in the program. Um, so I think the process of setting up an effective version of um, team rounds is uh, really, really important. Um, the other piece of information or advice I have about that is um, conflict is normal. Disagreements come up, and we, we try to normalize that process in families, also amongst our team. And we know that if our team is not functioning as a healthy family, in terms of everyone having a voice and coming to collaborative decisions, that we're not going to be able to support the families doing that as well. So we, we put a lot of support um, into our team and helping people with that process. Great. Thank you so much. And just thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing. And I. I know that there are many people on this call today who have been inspired, and I think what's exciting is while Diane and Michelle have described this innovative program for children and youth and their families, many of the core concepts we can apply to building patient and family-centered systems of care for, for seniors. And, you know, whether we're talking about in the ambulatory care, um, really we're not caring for an older patient alone in isolation, but that we reach out and find out who is the support person. This um, older gentleman it has early stage um, dementia, and his wife is critical to keeping him, him home and functioning as well as possible. She needs useful information. She needs uh, support and the connection to feel that she is really part of the the team, and you can kind of see the dynamics in this 
picture of they're all working together and um, that she does feel um, part of that team. And then, you know, building on what um, Diane and Michelle said about um, the rounds and fostering the um, teamness, <laughs> um, the clinical rounds, the teaching rounds, inpatient here you see at the um, Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, uh, a very collaborative team that is conducting rounds at the bedside with the patient. In this particular case, the family wasn't there that day, but the family is encouraged and supported in being part of the rounding team, which is really a safety strategy and a strategy to ensure the best transitions from the hospital to home and community care. This academic rounds program was funded by ARC and um, as a research study, and patient uh, older adults and their families were part of shaping this research. They're already beginning to get some very interesting data about reduction in falls when rounds are conducted this way and, and both the older patient and the family uh, feel like they're really part of the process and are part of the process. It's important to think about in the care of seniors that hospitals can be particularly stressful. I think they're stressful for probably just about any patient, but they're unusually vulnerable, older people are, and we know that social isolation is a risk factor. So it's important that we look at what our policies and practices are because often what happens is we isolate patients at their most vulnerable times from the people who know them best. And that puts them at risk for harm and, and costly, unnecessary care. Um, we also know that um, for many older adults uh, that um, hospitalization, either in an ICU or in a med surge unit, um, can be um, associated with reduced cognitive function. And families and other care partners, however, with a broad definition of family, um, they may be more aware of any change in cognitive function, you know, before uh, staff recognize it. Because they know the patient so well, they pick up these subtle changes. And so to think about it, we we need to go beyond thinking of families and um, other care partners as visitors, but really thinking of them as allies for quality and safety. There's a wonderful uh, report that was written several years ago, but it certainly is um, is relevant today. And Lucian Leap and Don Berwick and Carolyn Clancy, Jim Conway and others um, authored um, this article about transforming healthcare, a safety impairment. It was published in the BMJ. It's a very short article, and you could download it and discuss it within your organization. But one of the key points they make in this article is the family is respected as part of the care team, never visitors in every area of the hospital, including the emergency department and the intensive care unit. And I, th I think that has so much relevance for our discussion today. Um, there is no evidence that having restricted visiting hours of arbitrarily through policy restricting the access of the patient to their loved ones. And sadly, we've not been able to change that culture and those policies and practices in many hospitals so that or earlier this summer, the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care launched a campaign called Better Together, Partnering with Families, with the goal to eliminate re restricted visiting policies in 1,000 hospitals across North by 2017. And we don't want people to just take down signs. We want people to collaborate with families and other care partners as essential members of the care team according to the patient's preference. So I, ho I hope you will find the resources developed for that campaign useful, and I'll share more information later. But really in building this culture, 
change to support these kind of innovative programs that you heard about at Hasbro and you're going to hear about um, at Holy Cross, you really need leadership commitment to build a patient and family-centered system of care. And uh, in Atlanta, at the Emory Health System, they embedded uh, advancing the practice of patient and family-centered care in their uh, strategic plan so that their leadership will give it deliberate attention and it will move forward. And they put, put specific measures of what they wanted to change, and they were going to partner with patients and families and really make changes in the care delivery system and care processes. And once they did that with particularly nurse change of shift, they were able to see uh, over a two-year period, tremendous improvement, 40 percentage points improvement in overall nursing care and how well pain was controlled. And it was that partnership with frontline nurses to change that care practice that, that drove that kind of uh, outcome. They also were very involved in, de in planning a facility that um, is uh, serving a large number of older adults, an orthopedic and spine hospital. And uh, patients and families served by this hospital were critical to the planning of that hospital. Since the doors opened, they haven't been below the 96th percentile in patient satisfaction in the last six years. And the patient and family advisors, it wasn't just, and it, they certainly were involved in the design of facilities, but they were, de, were part of looking at the care processes, um, whether it was rounds, change of shift, how you are admitted, how you uh, are discharged. They helped develop all of those, and they're able to show that their length of stay is one day shorter than other specialty hospitals that they are benchmarked with. And what is exciting to see, patients and families were involved at the beginning, and they still um, are involved today. I wanted to give one last example uh, about emergency care, because we're going to hear about how uh, an innovative hospital transformed emergency care for seniors. This Contra Costa Regional Medical Center is a... Um, public hospital in Northern California, serving a very diverse community. And their hospital, like I bet many of your hospitals on the call today, um, have um, the um, problems with flow in the emergency room. And, and they partnered with patients and families to get these amazing results in the um, emergency department. And again, it's partnership with the community, staff across disciplines, and the people served. So thinking about there's possibility to bring about change in emergency departments, I think you will enjoy hearing the, about the innovative work from Holy Cross Hospitals and their seniors' uh, emergency department. Uh, with us today is Judith Rogers. She's president of Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring, Maryland. And she has served in that role since 2003. But what's, I think, wonderful, um, they clearly like her there and have such tremendous respect for her. And she's served in a variety of different roles over the years, as Senior Vice President of Operations, Vice President for Women and Children's Services, a Chief Nursing Officer, and Vice President for Patient Care Services. So I know you will enjoy learning from Judith, but first you get to hear her on uh, uh, video, and then uh, you will get to talk with her directly. Thank you. <laughs> Mary presented for an acute episode of required care for her diabetes complications. She was first screened for her age, found to be 75, that made her eligible for the Seniors ED. The Seniors ED started with focus on how do you maximize the family's contribution. So what's important to you as a family member? So we craft the whole plan of care around how we're advised. We committed to changing practice. As we attempted to render services to Mary, all she kept saying to us is, I have to go home. I have to go home. In the process of intake, we queried where Mary was in her life phase. That story revealed that Mary was the primary caregiver of her husband, who had Alzheimer's and who was home alone. No one was changing Mary's mind, but she was leaving. Because to her, no matter what, getting home to her husband was the priority. 
To care for Mary is to care for something larger. And we truly believed that in order to treat Mary, we had to treat her husband, even if it were to just admit him along with Mary until we could figure out the next step. And while he was there with us, we evaluated his Alzheimer's, we treated Mary, we admitted her too. The role of the family in follow-up care or transitional care or inclusion in service provision, that's such an important part of what we do and, and where we learn that the absence of family or someone there to work with us really uh, made us up our game. Our geriatric nurse practitioner began to make phone calls. It took a lot of digging to unearth that Mary had a remote niece. Even though she couldn't come, she did, in her mind, still want to be part of what we were doing. We make that easy. We'll show you exactly what your next steps need to be. We'll hold your hand. We were able to discharge Mary Stable with a follow-up appointment with our primary care physician, and we were able to arrange for in-home services ongoing uh, for her husband. But the best part of the story was we kept track of both Mary and her husband for weeks. It was almost as if we became the conduit of engagement. Hi, it's Holy Cross. Hi, we're just calling to let you know. Hi, do you have any questions for us? One person answers the calls, one person knows what's happening, and one person um, interfaces with the family with the sincerity, authenticity, genuineness that we really feel about our responsibility to care for seniors. My name is Judith Rogers, and I believe to be an expert in the care of seniors is to partner with families in the care of their loved ones. Hi, thank you. It's uh, just my um, pleasure to speak with you a little bit about Holy Cross Hospital and our Seniors Emergency Department. A little bit about us, we are a full-service acute care facility located in the Washington, D.C. area. Founded in 1963 by the Sisters of the Holy Cross, a 50-year legacy of our community. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, the uh, Seniors Emergency Department initiative is clearly a reflection of our understanding of what and how we might best serve um, those that trust us to do so. We have a large medical staff, greater than 1,000 members, and all in, we have greater than 400 beds. Uh, we do about 9,000 deliveries a year, so a very large obstetrical presence. And for a long time, we viewed ourselves primarily through that lens of being an obstetrical service. Um, clearly, the demographics, uh, as we came to better understand them, told us that we needed to be a bit more involved in the care of our, our seniors. We are the only teaching hospital for medical education in Montgomery County. Uh, we uh, to see revenue of greater than $300 million, and we remain very um, delighted with the amount of community benefit that our uh, acute care service activities permit us to turn right back into uh, those in our uh, neighborhoods. We have a robust uh, both inpatient and outpatient uh, acute environment, but are really, <laughs> in addition to OB, that which bustles is our emergency department. The vast majority of our admissions as well as our outpatient visits take place through our emergency, emergency service department, exceeding uh, greater than 90,000 visits annually. We have a very robust workforce, greater than 3,000 uh, staff members. We are a, a minority majority environment in that the majority of our workforce is non-Caucasian and made up by individuals of uh, more than a hundred different countries. In fact, we often will query the number of languages spoken by the staff and it uh, uh, always exceeds a hundred. We are honored to have received the Workplace Excellence Award for the last 14 consecutive years and especially in a period of time of great change and uh, white water in the healthcare industry to have a very stable workforce with no layoffs in the last decade. I mentioned our diversity uh, both in our staff, but it worth, uh, it's worth comment about uh, the diversity in both culturally and ethnically within the population that we serve. You can see the distribution uh, uh, in that in our slide here, but what's most uh, uh, important to the conversation is the overwhelming dominance of the senior population 
um, in our local community. It far exceeds the national average presently uh, and does so as we look forward to how the population will be distributed by 2018. We will see a projected up to 23% of seniors in our um, local market by 2018 compared to only a 2% growth in that same market of all age groups 0 to 64. So in this commitment to serve the community, it was clear to us that something really needed uh, to be um, done very special for our senior um, population. But in referencing Bev's comment about how it all starts with leadership, the uh, story of our seniors emergency department indeed started when our CEO of had his mom hospitalized in New Jersey. So here in Maryland, he's on the phone constantly trying to better understand what's happening, how he can be of service to those caring for her, that he can understand what really has brought her to the emergency department and what might then be the plan of care going forward and found the frustration overwhelmingly frustrating. You know, found the situation just overwhelmingly frustrating. There was, uh, he never spoke to the same person twice and answered, and he really couldn't offer his mom the support that he wanted to until such time as he could get there. And so the core purpose focus of our in decision to uh, create an emergency department specifically for individuals greater than 65 years old was to focus on improving patient care, improving the patient's experience, what they actually um, had to say about how they viewed their perspective of care, to engage the staff, um, towards improving satisfaction and to create greater workplace satisfaction for them, to um, look at the resources we were currently allocating to uh, those we served in our emergency department, making certain that our senior population received a sufficient um, resource allocation. We wanted to reduce our readmission rates, reduce our complication rates, look at our length of stay, and take a look about how we were actually being reimbursed and this whole issue of value-based reimbursement, how it would change were we to see uh, ambulatory sensitive care being delivered in the emergency department and not where it belonged, or to, if we were not uh, respectfully attentive to possibly preventable complications with all of the implication of how that would alter our reimbursement. Um, we looked not only to what we needed to do to optimize inpatient services for our seniors, but also to bridge or connect with what we appreciated to be a sizable amount of outpatient and community health resources in our community health arm of our health system. We had not, to date, successfully done that. So this endeavor was really to say, you know, we've got a lot to offer on the acute care side. How can we best then make certain that the transitions of care from the inpatient side to the patient's return to uh, either their home or their SNF or their nursing home, how can we optimize that so that resources don't just abruptly stop, but there can actually be an ease of transition into the next phase of requirement. We wanted to establish uh, effective and expedient uh, means for that to happen, and we wanted to also prepare for the fact that we know, we can predict the prevalence of functional decline, increased dependency, and increased morbidity when seniors with certain um, criteria experience an acute care episode. So in knowing that this is likely to happen or that the senior is vulnerable to this happening, it becomes then the task of the acute care um, environment to say, all right, how do we engage the family to plan for this probability? How do we look at these transitions such that we don't assume that the senior can go right back to where they came from because if indeed there has been a functional decline or a, a shift in um, the senior's ability to care for self, what can we get ready in anticipation of the potential for this, might, um, for this uh, potentially happening? And how can we engage the family in readying uh, for this uh, possibility? We also wanted to make certain that the environment of service delivery, both in our senior ZD as well as within all of our um, senior programs, acknowledged that over and above all else, safety for the senior must come first. And including the family deliver um, the uh, of care and the safest of environment was very important for lessons then that could be learned for when they uh, return to home. 
to our seniors at uh, ED, for example, we keep the temperature quite warm in there. In fact, that's a criteria. They must like tropics when they work in there. Uh, we have thick mattresses to be certain that the senior is most comfortable, low lights, large clocks and calendars, all preserving the autonomy, independence, and sensory um, age-appropriate um, demands that the senior might present us with, uh, all the while always thinking next steps of readiness uh, for transition. The family plays a huge role in everything we do. I think the video about uh, our patient Mary references of, uh, how we uh, pay special attention to inclusion. We know that respect and dignity, both for the family and that what they're going through uh, as a result of the seniors inpatient or acute episode, as well as for the patient themselves, we know that information is key. Going back to our health system CEO's experience, the primary frustration is, I don't know what's happening. And, and the horrible sense of being insufficiently able to support his mom in the experience that he found her in. So we know that making certain we have hardwired systems for inclusion of information for the senior as well as for their family is very important. We know that the family's engagement in devising the plan of care and in making decisions that are essential to the plan of care are critical, and as Bev's already said, this uh, the approach to this, that it's not a second thought or, oh yeah, I forgot to include the family, but it is actually to approach family members as essential participants, allies in the work that we're doing. You know, that took a bit to convince the staff that slowing things down to make certain that the degree of inclusion uh, was uh, achieved um, was of value because it wasn't that they wouldn't have wanted to do that, but that showing how important that became in making certain that the um, senior was appropriately cared for, it actually made their job easier over time. And that became evident as call bills were reduced and as the seniors um, were better um, supported during their stay, as examples in our seniors' ED. And so we drove that, that drove home to the staff in ev by just their own observation of what the payoff was, not only for the plan of care, but for their own experience in wanting to do best for these patients. Um, and we also knew that hardwiring this constancy of support systems was uh, going to be very important. As we began to work with the staff in um, their understanding of why we placed such value on family engagement, our position was simple. You know, we learned from the family. So this was not just a one-way street of, oh, yeah, you know, make certain the family is informed, but it was, and then stay quiet and listen and ask the right questions so that your understanding and your ability to treat, especially in the senior ZD, in a short time frame is informed and advised by the information um, and the unique understanding that the family can share about their loved one with us. We know, too, that our ability to expedite discharge and to be confident that the patient and the senior will continue to be well cared for is that we transition this ownership or stewardship of service to the family prior to the um, patient leaving. And without a doubt, we were able to show our staff that better outcomes are clearly supported by greater family engagement. They began to see um, how um, much um, better seniors fared by function of the follow-up we then are able to conduct later on that, that had not been present before. As you know, as the video I think well illustrated, to care for Mary, as examples by that discussion, was to care for something larger. There was just no caring for Mary if we weren't going to find out, figure out a way that we could care for her husband or relieve her of that burden of feeling that she could not self-care until her other responsibilities um, were addressed. That example and many others show us that when the family is not present or involved in care or the senior feels obligation as the family's caretaker, it really is di more difficult for us to provide optimum acute care services. There is questionable follow-up and the transitions of care are challenged. And so when we worked with the staff about being certain uh, of, of why the family was so important, 
these truths became um, very important in their training and in hardwiring how our processes work here about who is actually involved in the care of the senior. We ensured that in addition to making certain that the environment of the seniors emergency department was optimum in managing age-related uh, issues that challenged seniors, we made certain that our infrastructures of continued support were um, sustainable. Not only was the partnership with the loved ones of seniors important, but we wanted to make certain that we established a one-person interface here at the hospital where when families went home, there was one single individual that they could call back to and say, you know, I just got home with my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, and I'm confused, or I'm having difficulty connecting with a resource, or, you know, I thought I understood what you explained to me as part of the discharge information, but I'm not so certain I do now. We wanted also that person to be one that was had an ease of communicating sincerity, authenticity, and genuineness so that the family would be sure to stay contacted with us should uh, other issues arise um, down the road, and we could direct them to the next uh, service opportunity. Keeping the staff engaged you know, uh, was quite a challenge for us at the beginning. You can only imagine walking into an emergency department, seeing 90,000 um, visits um, uh, a year, and tell those nurses to slow down a bit. They were like, whoa, we think that's impossible. But we reminded them of the mission, that we really need to be the most trusted provider in the community. And in doing that, we needed to honor that the seniors presented to us with unique requirements that included the inclusion of the family, and it just had to happen. We also showed them how we had been successful throughout the house and the rest of the acute care environment. We had partnered with the Erickson School um, for an all-leader engagement uh, to, to show us how to truly engage the leadership who then could select and support the staff in this frontline ownership of uh, executing the priorities of all of our programs. We have an ACE unit, or Acute Care of Elders unit, in our inpatient side of the house that includes multidisciplinary rounding three times per, per week for all patients included in the program. You see there reference the seniors ED. You also see our senior, seniors ambulatory surgery departments, our caregiver support group, our geriatric resource <coughs> nurse council. All of them have as a, a focus how the family can be included in the services that we deliver. Selecting the leadership for our emergency department was critical. We needed someone with a significant background in emergency deli service delivery, but also someone who was savvy in the care and importance of geriatric uh, care. The staff, you know, they just need to want to be there. They need to embrace geriatric care. They're screened carefully for that, and they're also trained. Um, the, um, we have, and probably the most pivotal roles in our seniors emergency department our nurse practitioner and social worker. Those are the two points of constant contact for those that are sent, uh, patient seniors that are sent home who then call back and want to be stewarded through the next phase of their um, uh, care. Our, all of our staff clinicians in the emergency department are, must complete the geriatric emergency nurse education program by the ENA. And about 75 nurses throughout the house I've also completed the niche program or nurses improving care to health system elders. We thought that was vital. Our commitment to the staff was we would provide them the education they needed to be effective in the multiple seniors programs. That proved valuable past our own um, assumption and keeps the staff very engaged in the work that we're trying to do for seniors and their families. I've already mentioned the importance of follow-up. All of our seniors that are discharged from the emergency department or any of our programs, be it the um, ACE unit or our ambulatory surgery department, each of these programs have contact persons that the family is advised to follow up with should there be any uh, questions. The, we make follow-up phone calls, though, ourselves just to check in to be certain that, as you saw in the video, that all is well and going according to plan. We are determined to help seniors and their families follow up with primary care physician 
other future services when required, and family support. You know, we often find pending the severity of the acute episode, families get fatigued in their commitment to some of what clearly needs to continue, and we then uh, hook them up with respite care or we hook them up with support groups. But, you know, we make it clear through this authenticity of these dialogues that happen between our social workers and nurse practitioners that we're here for the senior member who sought care or needed care from us, but we're also here for the family. No easy task in the role that they play. And we make you know, purposeful effort to let them know we know what a challenge that is for them. We also are committed to poly polypharmacy review while patients are here in any one of our programs, as well as to go over medication management um, with our, our, the families, knowing full well that a large part of compliance uh, becomes the burden of or the responsibility of the family member. All in all, we think that it's uh, quite a robust program that uh, our, the feedback from our staff, uh, from our staff as well as from our patients, very positive, and we're very, um, we're just delighted to have been the, the first hospital in, in, in the country to have um, done something like this, and uh, we remain committed to keeping it robust and serving the community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judith. Oops, excuse me, let's see if we can go back. Uh, there we go. Um, thank you, Judith, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for the really amazing pioneer work that Holy Cross is doing in building um, both the innovative program for seniors in the emergency department, but really bringing this uh, focus to all the work that you do in your hospital to make sure that the hospital is responsive to uh, the special needs of seniors and, and their families. With a, a mom who is who just celebrated a hundred and first birthday, I'm particularly <laughs> grateful. We have I, I wish she lived in Silver Spring, Maryland and, and not in Florida. <laughs> Uh, to be able to use uh, the wonderful care that you all are providing. Um, one of the situations that I'm sure you all have dealt with and um, is that, you know, there often families have complex needs and sometimes elders are in vulnerable situations. There may be cases involving abuse or allegation that there is abuse of the elder um, how are you dealing with that in in your emergency departments? Is, is there s something you could share with the group about how you're ensuring the safety, with you know great respect for families, but also assuring the safety of the older person? Yes, certainly. You know, I mentioned before that one of our biggest learnings from this program was the responsibility we have as an acute facility to streamline our interface with our community resources, whether they are ours, our um, outpatient uh, social workers, or our community health workers, or the county. Living in Montgomery County, an incredibly robust uh, platform of programs, just whether it's senior abuse protection and or it's elder you know, services, but it's, uh, and we really had been naive to some of what was out there. And so one of the functions of the staff is if we suspect or are worried or have any of the, um, you know, signals that we may need to get others involved, we now are very adept at saying, whoops, we're going to turn this over to, and then fill in the blank, whether it's our elder abuse protective services in the county or whatever the need may be. So it's really knowing, one, recognizing that there's a requirement, and that's part of this assessment done by our social workers and nurse practitioners, and second, in real time, in the moment prior to discharge, connect either affecting an intervention at that time or making certain there's a follow-up after discharge. Um, thank you for, for answering that question. And I'm wondering in terms of, we had questions um, for the the team from Hasbro, as well as uh, to think about um, how these programs are financed, and I'm I'm curious in terms of the um, startup for your emergency program. Did you seek outside funding? What and and then what about ongoing uh, financing of the program? 
you know, thanks for that question because uh, many people ask us uh, how hard it was. Was it? It was the easiest part because it doesn't cost a lot. To it is a very you know when you look at the elements of the program, it's really just a decision of what we focus on as and so and it's a it's a process commitment. We had a to start up in terms of the environment of care though, we had the space. So it was outfitting the space with the lighting and the flooring, uh, and we had a hundred dollar, hundred thousand dollar grant that we used for that purpose. But that was a single one-time investment. The ongoing staffing really is now just hardwired into the budget. And if you look at the commitment of, you know, uh, of how much staff per patient, it's not that much different than uh, the acute side, you know, the more acute side of the ED with the exception of the investment in some of the uh, support roles, such as nurse practitioner, social worker, and we have a coordinator. But that is nominal compared to what we think is the payoff, which is the you know improved outcomes and the likelihood of uh, uh, fewer readmissions and um, complications. So that's how we did it. That's, that's very helpful. There's another question that... <clears throat> um, from a patient advocacy uh, individual that how did the hospital justify the cost of the husband's admission for the purpose of insurance coverage? Oh, we got lucky there. Uh, he, <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, he I, you know, I apologize, can't remember what the clinical indication was, but and I realized in the video that was a piece that, I'm, and thank you for picking that up because, uh, you know, I, I wish I had mentioned that he was found when we sent someone out to the home to uh, have a clinical indication for admission as well. So it's not a social admission. He, uh, I don't remember whether it was um, his uh, hypertension out of control or whether it was uh, 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 CHF, but it was something that um, clearly was, uh, I, I want to say justifiable, but that sounds fabricated, but was warranted. Great. <clears throat> uh, another question um, is about uh, tools and technologies to facilitate this coordination of care between the family, the uh, other caregivers, and, and the, the whole rest of the healthcare team. Um, you mentioned that was used to facilitate conversations, but uh, right. any other te health information technology or technology? Yes, yeah, since that video was, I was just my answer was going to be yes, you know, since the video was shot, which actually impressed me with how fast technology, uh, you know. But um, since that time, we actually have a patient portal. So um, all patients at the time of admission now are requested, they're, you know, they have an option, but they're requested to provide us their um, email or a, the email of a loved one, and we can actually then arrange for them to go right into their electronic medical record. Now, that provides ease of data, but the actual discussion that happens is remains uh, just phone conversation. But sharing of uh, the pertinent health information uh, is now done through a patient access portal. That's that's interesting. Um, it's great to hear that evolution just in a short period of time. Right, I'm maybe. wondering, there was a question related to the use of technology um, and helping the the program at Hasbro, Diane and Michelle, um, they wondered if, whether you all were using technology in similar ways to keep um, children, youth, and families involved and foster the coordination. Um, yeah, we're we're exploring various options in terms of that. One inter very interesting area with our population that we've recently expanded on technology is in working with kids with various versions of chronic pain. Um, and the use of biofeedback, um, including in investment in some new um, biofeedback equipment and handheld monitors and things like that that have been very interesting to pilot. Uh, and in addition, we, we're we hopeful that at some point in the future we'll be able to utilize the Get Well Network, um, a modified version within our setting as well, um, to support um, some of those same goals. Wonderful. Great. Thank you very much to all of you, Judith and Diane and Michelle, for sharing your experience and your insights about this wonderful work. Um, I wanted to just share with you other resources that might help um, 
the audience today move forward with advancing the practice of patient care in specific populations or across all ages. Um, there are a number of tools um, at the IPFCC website. Um, uh, there is a brand new, um, we are featuring um, this um, month, a new report from the Macy Foundation about interprofessional education and how to partner with patients, families, and communities. Uh, here is the Better Together website, uh, which is a part of the IPFCC website with videos and tools and many resources that you can use um, to change the concept of families as visitors. Um, here are some of the references that um, I cited when we talked about, particularly talked about caring for older adults and how it's so important that we need to um, change the concept of families and visitors, and there's some very interesting uh, articles by uh, security chief at the University of Michigan linking patient and family center practice with s security. And um, ARC has uh, a number of wonderful resources that are available on its website and a uh, terrific kind of uh, guide for patient and family engagement to enhance quality and safety in hospitals. And there are a number of tools also in the Patient-Centered Medical Home Resource Center. So I hope that you will be inspired by the thoughtful uh, conversation today and you'll want to tap into these uh, resources. And I, I'd like to now turn it over to Judy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This has been an amazing from uh, two wonderful uh, innovations uh, occurred in our process. So I thank you so much to our moderator, our presenters, and especially to our audience. Um, and as Bev just mentioned, there's a variety of uh, resources available to you, so we hope that you do explore those. Um, we invite you to visit our website and LinkedIn page and encourage you to follow us on Twitter for future upcoming web events and latest developments. And in just a moment, after the event has concluded, an evaluation will appear on your screen. We sincerely hope that you will participate in this evaluation. It helps us to improve our offerings, and we get a sense of how you're using the information that you've just heard. So your comments uh, are very helpful to us. Uh, not only so we know what you're learning and what we need to provide, but also for us to plan our future events that do meet your needs. You can also contact us at any time at info at innovations.arc.gov. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Good afternoon.